I'll tell you first how the idea came about, and then some of the practical aspects of NCAB, and finally how it can be used with other data. And I should probably preface this saying, um, you won't see all that much about 3D models directly here, because what I'm really focused on is how we can use 3D models to um, talk, about, talk about buildings and talk about construction. Um, so the idea of this, uh, of NCAP came about during the, my work at Tel Mozan in northeastern Syria, where I excavated the, um, and published the palace of King Tupkish. You can see it on the left. The palace dates to the Akkadian period, so the early Bronze Age of Mesopotamia, and it covers a large area, over 60 meters on a side, and has to date only partially been uncovered, probably about half. Here is a plan overlaid, and here's the plan on its own. You can see the symmetry, um, the symmetry, symmetrical elements in the, in the construction plan there. The palace walls are constructed of stone and unbaked mud brick in two phases, you can see. And stone is also used in the formal courtyard here in the center of the slide. Now, this um, building I focus on and my approach to the analysis of the architecture has three parts. First, a chaîne operatoire to define the steps of construction, then algorithms to quantify the energy needed, and finally a 3D model to give the volumes of the built space, the, the data for the specific building. To give you a specific example, let's use mud brick production. First, we have the chaîne opératoire, where one sees the various steps, mixing, pairing, packing the form, and so on. But a chaîne opératoire only gives us the steps in the process. It doesn't allow us to understand the mathematical dynamics or to quantify the, um, the task being done. And so the second portion of the analysis is uh, you study in algorithms. And this was done in this, for this particular algorithm, was done for, um, as a uh, project in experimental archaeology. And here you can see this is the palace we've been talking about. These are the mud bricks, and here's the mud brick production area. In more detail here, they're mixing the mud with the chaff from using water. Here's the pulling up of the form. These are the bricks being dried over several days in several different phases, you can tell by the color. And the final bricks stacked, ready for use. Now, the data from this experiment gives us the fact that four people in 12 hours, spread over three days, produced about 1,000 mud bricks of 19.2 cubic meters. And from that, we can then derive an algorithm saying that 2.5 person hours are needed to produce one cubic meter of mud brick. In this case, the algorithm is derived from experimental archaeology, but other algorithms are, can be derived from comparative experiments, anthropological experiments on the, on the main, as well as information from textual sources. Now, these are, I showed you just the one algorithm. These are all of the algorithms that I used in the analysis of the palace. And uh, there are quite a few and, and describe all sorts of steps in the uh, chain of our not only the mud break of our chain of our but also things like the transportation, the construction, and as well as all of the uh, algorithms that are tied to stone. Now we have, we know the steps of the construction and we have the algorithms as best, the, as many as we can have, as many as we can discover for the quantifying it. But what we need is the last piece of the puzzle, the 3D model, which gives us the specific volumetric data for this case study, let's say. This is um, the model, and uh, the goal was to have the 3D model going hand in hand with the excavation, so it was done as we were excavating. And it's built, enti built entirely from measurements taken in the, in the field. So obviously the model is not here meant for aesthetic purposes. It's probably the ugliest 3D model you'll see in these days, but I'm really not interested in how it looks. Because each of these, each piece, each of these walls is built up purely from 
uh, from the coordinates um, for you defining very, very precisely the centimeter accuracy, the volume of the um, the volume of the wall itself. And the three D mo model, my use of it is really not as an image. It's to calculate the materials that have been used. And so what I have here is that this total number of uh, mud bricks used to construct the palace is nearly a thousand cubic meters. And that's, that's the estimated reconstruction, but the 3D model actually gives you also the exact measurements of the archeological record. And then what I've added on top is a minimum. This is actually a minimum uh, volume for the, for the palace itself. Putting this information together allows us to say that around 2,000 person hours were needed to make the mud bricks used in the palace. And remember here, we're again only speaking of the production of the mud bricks. We're not talking about transportation, building, or all of the other materials used, stone, roofing, beams, whatnot, plaster. So that was, let's say, the inspiration for the, for the NCAB project. And um, I then received funding from the NEH to expand the aspect of the algorithms. Because while the algorithms that I was showing you were all designed to help me analyze the one structure, the Palace of Mazan, obviously they can be applied to a wide range of different edifices. That's the whole point. Um, and so the goal of NCAB focus on the algorithms. The goal of NCAB is then to provide interactive algorithms so that other scholars can put in their own data, providing examples of research paths, combining clusters of algorithms, which basically follow the chain operatoire that we saw towards the beginning, to discuss in detail the terminology used behind the algorithms, and to give the direct bibliographical references, as well as a critique of the sources, which is kind of the weak leg, let's say, of the project. And finally, it's an open access project, so to allow for additions and changes to the, both the input and the program itself. The NCAB algorithms are available, or will be available, because I'm actually talking about a project that will be completed in July. Um, so it's still a little bit rough around the edges, but, um, but it will be finished by, uh, by the summer. And um, the, each algorithm is available as here on an HTML page as an interactive formula with interactive fields here. Um, and these pages are created by a Python program which take XML input files. This is just one of the algorithms, but up to date we have, a, I have around 100 of these for various, all the various aspects that we've been talking about. Um, the algorithms can be clustered to show the, something like the chain repertoire. So for example, we have the number of bricks made per day as the algorithm that we just saw, but then we can add on to the, an analysis of the weight of the bricks that one would then have to, then you would take that answer from that um, algorithm and you could understand the transportation costs in terms of energy the expenditure and energy for digging the foundations, the amount of mortar that would have been needed, transporting that mortar to the, to the build site, and so on and so on. The possibilities are endless, one might think. Um, here, the HTML pages give links to explain the terminology and the bibliographical information. So we have the, the algorithm type, which, leads, which is querying tough in this one example, and it leads to uh, a static HTML page discussing uh, tuft quarrying, uh, something I've learned a lot about recently. Um, and then position in the process, whether it's procurement of materials, the building instruction itself, um, the source type, if it's ethnographic, textual, or experimental archaeology, the area, and, uh, and so on. And the bibliographical, represent the bibliographical information, as well as the raw input data, which you see here, it's just a very standard XML um, input file. Now, the users that I envisage are three, the 
primary user, of course, is the web user using the HTML pages, putting into the interactive fields data and getting answers with which they build an understanding of their own structure and they build an argument and so on. Um, the project also allows then for people to add or change the algorithms. With, and the reason that I chose the XML format was because of the ease for which one can, can copy the format from, um, from pre-existing algorithms and, um, and make changes quite quickly. And then finally, there's the programmer modifying the program code itself. And all of these are on, the, the web user would, is, can find it under www.ncap.net. And while, and the, both the algorithms and the code are present as a, as a GitHub um, project. The project is not online, as I was saying, but it will, um, it will be online soon. And it's already present as uh, the ncap.net website here and will open around, if not before July. Um, 2018. Now, um, the last point that I want to make is to talk about is use or perhaps reuse. Um, because one of the, once one plugs in one's own data, one needs to be able to compare it to other structures. And there isn't a whole lot of data um, yet about, um, about other analyses of, um, of um, energetics. So um, the, the real need is to be able to compare these energy investments across different sites and across cultural spheres. The methodology then has to be re reproducible with the algorithms and assumptions to estimate labor's, labor investments has to be explicit, which this NCAP is uh, doing. And it has to be able to validate, expand, and modify algorithms based on explicit links to specific field observations. But where does the potential data come from if other people aren't, haven't yet published much on, um, on um, energetics? Whether new excavations, publications, or open data. And that's where um, open contracts can play a central role as a provider of data for reuse I don't know if any of you heard, but I had a, discussed in a paper this morning that I co-authored with Eric Kanza talking about how open context is um, a great repository for data publishing source for reuse in archaeology. Open data, con open context data publication then puts the emphasis on integrating various forms of documentation, structured data, field notes, media into a cohesive whole. Different observed entities, stratigraphic units, architectural features, finds, are linked together to support browsing and queries. And what this means for NCAM is that users can browse and cite specific archaeological, archaeologically meaningful entities, contexts, finds, linking them to specific sets of algorithms in order to produce arguments regarding the construction processes based directly on archaeological data. Excavation recording, as we all know, mixes structured, less structured, and multiple media forms of documentation. Um, and there's le more structured data and less structured data, as well as photography plans and so on. As an example, I'd like to refer to the Kenan Tepe that Eric and I published in a recent article um, and at this point, I'd like to remember Bradley Parker, a colleague who passed away recently and was the co-director of the Kenan type of project. By using open contexts keyword search and drawing both on journal data, drawing both on the journal, journal data available and photographic documentation, we know from through open contexts that Kenantepe had a 300 meter wall in circumference. The foundation was about 1.8 meters thick. We know the brick dimensions and the surviving wall height. Thus, with these, this information, it gives us a volume of 648 cubic meters of the, of the wall as, is, as exists in the archaeological record. Removing 1 6 for mortar, which is another algorithm, we're left with 540 cubic meters. We're one to estimate a height of two and a half meters, which seems to be about a minimum. 
then the volume would have, be, would have been 1350 cubic meters with mortar or 1125 without. Thus, the, what we have in the archaeological record, the 540, would have taken 1,620 Persian hours, while the minimum height of two and a half meters would have taken about 2,800 hours, 2,800 hours. And what's nice is that one can then compare this to the AP Palace in Urkesh, where the 826 cubic meters would have taken about um, 2,000 person hours. And so what is interesting is that, a, um, that the energy used in, for this one aspect of production used in creating the uh, palace in Mozan is about the same effort that a small settlement in uh, the proto um, in the proto-historical period would have required to make the, a city wall. Thus the advantage here that open access provides is that the structured media, structured data helps narrow search for the needed documents to, to pinpoint exactly the kinds of information you need for specific algorithms. And that the structured data is text which lacked or gave only partially provided evidence, but the links then to photos and plans to prove fundamental. So I think that um, this, to bring it back to 3D, that the use of algorithms is uh, a way of giving meaning to, the, to 3D data and understanding buildings in a whole other way. Um, using the 3D data, which is not the visual aspect of the 3D data, but the volumetric aspect. Thank you for your interest.